I'm delighted to introduce today's presenters. They are Bench Ansfield, Claire Barnes, Anna Dunsing, Rebecca Flemister, Jason, uh, I'm sorry, Jason Martin. Um, we'll be delighted to answer your, quest, answer your questions after the final presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, I will turn this over to Bench. Thanks, Nancy. So I'm Ben Jansfield. I'm a PhD candidate in American Studies here at Yale in my micro exhibition, The Road to Ruin, Bronx Frontier and the Harvest of Rubble, considers the road as an object in its own right, mining the collections of the Beinecke and Sterling's library, Sterling Library's manuscripts and archives to ask what happens when it cracks and corrodes. The specific roads in question lined the South Bronx in the 1970s during an era when governmental neglect and landlord abandonment and arson left the physical infrastructure of these black and brown neighborhoods in a state of ruin. As the, paved, as the pavement of these roads breached, their dense layers of asphalt and concrete touched air for the first time in decades and the resulting debris collected in raw mounds pockmarking the borough. In the wreckage, some spied opportunity. Quote, one material in abundant supply in the South Bronx is rubble the Ford Foundation reported in 1980, championing one of its grantees, the organization Bronx Frontier, an effort to monetize the remains of abandoned buildings and byways. So my exhibition turns a spotlight on that forgotten uh, environmental organization, which beginning 1976, collected rubble from torched buildings and dilapidated roads and turned it into compost for gardens. Slide, please. The group's call to green the Bronx was controversial as it appeared to accept and even profit off of the city, state, and federal government's disinvestment of the borough. So the exhibition showcases photographs and organizational ephemera to offer an archival meditation on the politics of race in the nascent environmental movement. Slide, please. So here you see Bronx Frontier co-founder Jack Flanagan on the right former police officer in the 41st precinct, which called itself Fort Apache. And to his left or to his right is Lady Bird Johnson, the former first lady. And they're on Charlotte Street in the Bronx. Charlotte Street was likely the most infamous road in the US in these years, a national symbol of what became known as the urban crisis. Sandra Baker, who took the photograph and included it in her exhibition, The Work of Our Hands, Photographs of a Resurgent Bronx, had visited the borough as part of a White House delegation in 1979. Charlotte Street had first been catapulted into the public eye by a different White House delegation that was President Jimmy Carter's visit to uh, Charlotte Street and other spots in the Bronx in 1977. Slide, please. The three block expanse became the centerpiece of Carter's national urban policy. And as a result, it was a mecca for barnstorming politicians from Ronald Reagan to Jesse Jackson to Bill Clinton over the next few decades. When Lady Bird Johnson toured the Bronx shortly after founding the National Wildflower Research Center, that was in 1983, Bronx Frontier's Jack Flanagan naturally made the obligatory stop to Charlotte Street. Four years earlier, in 1978, Bronx Frontier had begun its composting program in response to 750 acres of rubbled land in the South Bronx. Slide, please. Photographer Ray Mortensen captured this landscape in textured images like this one, which inventoried the broken bricks, loose mortar, and cracked concrete blanketing the built environment. Bronx Frontier acquired a pulverizer to grind these materials into a sand-like gravel that could be mixed with organic salads to create compost. Thus began what they build as the first urban composting pro project in the United States. Slide, please. When the milled rubble was folded into manure from the Bronx Zoo and organic waste from the nearby Hunts Point produce market, it yielded a rich compost marketed toward the city's burgeoning community garden movement. Bronx Frontier packaged the compost in two pound bags and sold it as Zoo at Bloomingdale's and other retail outlets. It cost $2 a bag. The group's efforts to monetize the ruins of the borough were contentious. Critics of Bronx Frontier denounced the organization as a green version of planned shrinkage, likening it to the city's notorious mid-1970s policy of withdrawing city services like fire protection and sanitation 
from neighborhoods of color in the midst of population loss. Slide please, and this is my last slide. The group's founding members and staff were almost entirely white, middle-class, non-residents of the Bronx, and its evocation of the frontier traded on well-rehearsed racial and colonial scripts. In the words of one funding appeal, quote, the pioneer spirit for centuries, it has made America's wilderness bloom. Five years ago, a dedicated group of resourceful pioneers began the arduous task of reclaiming a new kind of American wilderness, the devastated South Bronx. So like any frontier myth, this one turned on an erasure, the residents themselves who knew the Bronx, not as a wilderness, but as their home. In the greening of the Bronx, they asked what would happen to those homes. And in the harvest of rubble, would they reap any of the yield? Variations of those questions continue to plague the environmental movement today. And the archival record is rich with insights into the historical possibilities and the pitfalls of green urban politics. Thank you. I'm going to turn it now over to Claire. Hi, all. Um, thank you so much to Nancy, Karen, and those at the Beinecke for coordinating this micro-credential. My name is Claire Barnes, and I am a first-year master's student in the Divinity School, studying religion and ecology. My micro-exhibit is titled Epistolary Travelers, Natural Encapsulations in the O'Keefe and Stieglitz Archive and My Pandemic Letters. Next slide, please. As I'm sure many of you know, painter Georgia O'Keeffe and photographer and gallery owner Alfred Stieglitz were some of the most important figures of the 20th century American culture. Both have left long lasting impacts on American art and aesthetics. Stieglitz's exhibition of nude photographs of O'Keeffe rocked the art scene in the 1920s and marked the beginning of a tumultuous relationship and marriage that is very much documented in the Beinecke archive. At that point of the mid 1920s, O'Keeffe was known for her paintings of New York skyscrapers and would become well remembered for her landscape paintings inspired by the environment of the American West, particularly New Mexico. Next slide, please. Both artists are their own persons, even though I speak of their correspondence. The two exchanged over 25,000 pieces of paper between 1915 and 1946. Their correspondence documents the ebb and flow of their romantic life, in addition to musings with friends, family, and other prominent artists of the 20th century. Next slide, please. So my micro exhibit looks at a select few letters in which Stieglitz and O'Keefe included encapsulations, items like pressed flowers and feathers, as you can see here. I explore the animacies, the life given to these epistolary travelers and the fantasies of travel, passion, waning desires and place embodied by them. In this short presentation, I'll highlight several encapsulations that represent different periods of Stieglitz and O'Keeffe's relationship. But as per the title of Epistolary Travelers, I'm also interested in thinking about these natural encapsulations as their own travelers. Travelers taken from their natural geography, traveling by US mail with the Postal Service as their vehicle, and now being stored in this archival space. My language is inspired by an amazing thought leader at the Divinity School, Professor Willie James Jennings, whose work asks us to recognize the world as both animate and communicative so that we can challenge humanity's perceived ownership and domination of the land and by extension of people. Next slide, please. In 1929, O'Keefe and Rebecca Strand, wife of photographer Paul Strand, embarked on a trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Once in New Mexico, O'Keefe moves to Taos at the invitation of Mabel Dodge Luhan, who provides O'Keefe with studio space. Ardently communicating by both telegram and letter, Stieglitz sends O'Keefe this pressed red flower, which graced the cover of my faraway one, a collection of select letters in the archive. Next slide, please. While in pursuit of artistic inspiration and freedom, O'Keefe routinely traveled between Taos and New York for the remainder of her relationship with Stieglitz. Stieglitz writes of enthusiasm for life and passion for O'Keefe in this letter. He writes, so we jumped into a plane. It was such a grand day, absolutely clear. Sky so blue and the pilot flew higher and turned in a circle and made a great swoop. The mountains looked upside down. The lake was running downhill. It was a grand sensation." End quote. And next slide, please. So this is a close-up of the same letter. On the left and later in the letter, Stieglitz writes, 
When I came home, I was asked how about my heart? And my answer was to hell with my heart. I don't understand such language. The heart touched the blue of the sky and the blue touched my woman. You are the blue. He asked it on the right. I love you, do you feel it? Next slide, please. Stieglitz signed off this letter with very, very much love. And in December of 1929, opens his final gallery called An American Place, where he will showcase many of O'Keeffe's paintings of the landscape in New Mexico, the landscape she will come to call home. Next slide. Feathers, flight, freedom, movement. O'Keeffe and Stieglitz send each other feathers in their letters more frequently than flowers. Stieglitz includes a single feather in a letter to O'Keeffe in June 1934, who's on a trip to New Mexico and writes, and come back when you're ready, come back strengthened, ready to face our jobs together. And this is the uh, feather on the right and his letter on the left. Uh, next slide, please. In 1940, O'Keeffe sends Stieglitz a single feather as well and reflects on sitting under the stars in the sky. She notes of her environment, it looks so wonderful out, end quote. Hinting at Stieglitz's sickness, O'Keeffe worries if she should return to New York, but expresses a love of her environment. And while I'm not a birding expert, it is interesting to think about the ways in which these feathers represent the unique geographies in place, which are very much alive and different, that both O'Keeffe and Stieglitz call home. And in this slide, you can see the letter that she sends to Stieglitz on the left and her letter in the middle. Next slide, please. In June 1943, at the very end of the pair's marriage and a year before Stieglitz's death, Alfred Stieglitz writes to O'Keefe of life back east. I'm so glad you are in healthy surroundings and not these decaying ones. You decaying. These pictures have not a trace of decay in them. The decay is in me. The inability to do. I think of your little white flower and I'm sure something very handsome will have come out of it. No trace of decay, you're quite the contrary. Affirmation of life beautiful, healthy. O'Keefe not only included natural encapsulations like pressed flowers, but photographs of herself from the ranch camping trips and outings in the West. Very different in tone to the previous letter from Stieglitz in 1929. In this letter, Stieglitz contemplates decay, health, and life, a testament to the fleeting desire for youth and beauty at the end of Stieglitz's own life, perhaps. In this 1943 correspondence with O'Keefe, Stieglitz signs off with a flower representing nativity as you can see here. And he writes, a baby's breath, a kiss. Next slide, please. You can read more about the ways in which I position these encapsulations as their own travelers in my micro exhibition, excuse me, where there are guided questions for thought. Inspired by the enormity of the collection, which O'Keefe arranged to be donated at the urging of Carl van Vechten, I look at some of my own pandemic letters, correspondence with family and friends, um, here you can see um, there are some which are distorted by rogue Clorox wipes in my bag. And I ask viewers to think about the ways that we collect and archive our daily life, the ways that we might ignore or interact with our animate and communicative world through correspondence. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Uh, thank you so much. And I'd be happy to field any specific questions in the Q&A. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Dunsing. I'm a PhD candidate in history and African American studies. And I, I wanted to start um, to, by thanking my, my peers, my colleagues, and thanking you know, everyone involved in directing this project and mentoring us this term. Um, my micro exhibition involves kind of zooming in on one aspect of my dissertation research, which looks at Black radical exile during the Cold War and the global movements of African-American communists, anti-fascists, fellow travelers, and other radicals from the 1950s to 1970s. And in particular, I wanted to think about how travel functioned as a kind of self-exile for prominent figures deemed transgressive in the context of the Cold War, a kind of protective escape from the US, the expanded US government's capacity to surveil, detain, and blacklist um, in the context of the Cold War, even as this moment also saw an emerging consensus on a limited liberal vision of, of civil rights. And for the exhibit, I wanted to look at uh, specifically African-American travel in divided Germany between the Federal Republic in the West and the De Democratic Republic in the East, and even more closely look at uh, acts of border crossing 
um, at the German-German border and the political critique provoked by the dramatic political juxtaposition provided by, um, by, by the German-German border and by the wall. And the title of my micro exhibition, it comes from a popular crooner country song called Don't Fence Me In, which was used by a group of English speaking expats in West Berlin as the theme song for their radio show that they hosted specifically for American GIs stationed nearby. And it was meant to be a kind of tongue in cheek jab at American soldiers who were in West Berlin, literally fenced in, so to speak. Um, next slide, please. The Berlin Wall looms especially large in American cultural memory as a symbol of the Iron Curtain and the Cold War writ large uh, in the popular Western imagination. The wall really symbolized Soviet oppression and marked the line between freedom and tyranny. Whereas in a place like East Germany, the wall was often referred to by the state as an anti-fascist protective barrier. Um, what struck me in my own work and especially exploring the Beinecke collections, um, you know, despite these rigid understandings and cultural memory on both sides, how readily prominent African-American radicals traversed that border and the rich meaning that that act of border crossing gave them um, sort of imbued in their black internationalist perspectives on global Cold War politics, as well as their, their broader visions of black freedom in this historical moment. Uh, next slide, please. Paul and Islanda Robson are among the most well-known for their global travel in the context of the Cold War. The Robesons, um, before that time, they spent much of their time abroad throughout the 1930s, not only for their respective careers, but also in defiance of American racism and prejudice, and even more from their, um, in the spirit of Leninist internationalism, and, and, and as a way to show and build solidarity in the global fight against fascism and to advocate for anti-imperialism and self-determination for oppressed peoples around the world. It was on the basis of this approach and on the basis of the Robeson's ties to the Communist Party that the State Department refused to renew Paul Robeson's passport, restricting his ability to travel abroad between 1950 and 1958 at great personal and financial cost. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when the Robesons were able to travel again, they frequented London and Moscow, but they actually remained hesitant about Germany because they had had a very chilling run in with Nazi officers there during a visit in the early 1930s. But Paul Robeson was nonetheless an icon in the Soviet bloc, which now included East Germany, of course, and he was a widely embraced anti-fascist, anti-imperialist hero there. And the state made many attempts to host the Robesons and they were finally successful in 1960. And you're seeing images from that trip here in an East German photo souvenir pamphlet. Um, and the solidarity movement in East Germany and that embrace of, of figures like Robeson was very much engineered and enforced by the government, which in some ways appealed to the Robesons, it appealed to Paul Robeson in particular. But even as these ideas were packed into the founding myths of the Socialist Republic, there remained many jarring undercurrents of the recent Nazi past and continuities of it uh, that other African-American activist intellectuals addressed more explicitly. Uh, so next slide, please. 19, in September of 1964, Langston Hughes traveled to West Germany as a guest of the Berlin Folk Festival, and, and he was warm, warmly welcomed there and, and widely read in both West and East Germany. But Hughes, like the Robesons, had serious misgivings about coming to Germany just 20 years after the collapse of the Third Reich. And Hughes had last been to Berlin in 1932 and found it a really bleak city then. And he returned to a very different city in 1964, but he found the city um, differently bleak, so to speak. Uh, next slide, please. Here you see sketches of a piece that Hughes drafted about that trip um, for the New York Post. And he wrote, I tried to come to Berlin with a clear conscience, but I didn't quite make it. I am sorry, I couldn't quite forget the past. I could not put Hitler out of my mind. Hughes explained in the piece that he couldn't shake the memories and the ghosts of the Holocaust and the mass death and suffering caused by the war. Um, during the trip itself, he had also crossed into East Berlin to visit old friends from New York who, who lived there. And he noted in this piece that the wall and the dogs and the wire fences made him think of Birmingham bus stations and segregation and color lines. Um, and, and he was left uh, 
quite disconcerted. And, and he actually concludes the article, when my plane took off to Paris, I felt like singing. Next slide, please. My final example today is Angela Davis, who went to graduate school in Frankfurt, West Germany between 1965 and 1967. And during this time, uh, she became involved with the West German student movement. And what was really formative for her in the midst of all that was when she crossed over into East Berlin to attend the May Day celebration. And the event really left its mark on her mind and on her political development. In particular, she was struck uh, by the East German third world solidarity campaigns and the state's directness um, as, a, as, a, as a overwhelmingly white country in combating its fascist past. And she felt that project far surpassed parallel projects in both West Germany and the West more generally. She would bring these ideas about anti-fascism merged with anti-racism back to the United States where she completed her studies, embedded herself in communist and black power politics. And, um, and to, to a degree, I can't get into the, the details for today. She was in 1970 detained on a contrived charge of kidnapping and murder. And during her 18th month imprisonment and trial, she became a, an absolute icon in East Germany and around the world amidst calls to free Angela Davis and all political prisoners. And after her acquittal, Davis returned to the Soviet bloc and to East Germany specifically. And in her autobiography, which she was working on at this time, she framed this trip explicitly as a fight from flight from Western modes of racism and repression. And she actually describes the moment when she crosses from West Berlin in to East Berlin by explicitly inverting the US attitude of, of treating East Germany as the repressive police state. And she instead emphasizes the bureaucracy and racism and restrictions that she faced while she was she was in West Berlin and West Germany. I plan to dive into a lot more detail about these cases of Cold War border crossing in my micro exhibition. But for now, uh, thank you so much for listening. This is my last slide. Oh, that's my last slide. <laughs> thank you all. Hello, my name is Rebecca Flemster. I'm a first year uh, dramaturgy and dramatic criticism student at the Yale School of Drama. Um, I'm very excited in my first year to be able to um, be a part of the Beinecke micro exhibit. And I'm focusing on black performance on the road, um, traveling black American performance post-Civil War, which I thought was an appropriate subject um, because it touches on themes of national division, um, cautious movement, both within the United States and abroad, um, appropriate for our current times, um, and especially in the vein of blackness and performance. Um, the specific examples that I'm going to be touching on today um, delve into the tension between preserving Black cultural history and advocating for Black dignity and the necessitation of appealing to the white gaze in order to um, achieve success and capital um, at a time when performance was um, one of the strongest means for um, African-American advancement. Um, next slide. So just to create a foundation for um, what I'm going to be talking about in my later slides, um, pre-Civil War, uh, two of America's uh, first performance uh, genres were um, Black-based minstrelsy and also Tom Show's um, Black-based minstrelsy obviously was um, where um, white people would put on um, Black Cork and perform uh, skits and song and dance routines um, that were very um, negative portrayals of African-Americans, but also in contrast, um, Harriet um, Venture Stone, Stone Uncle Tom's Cabin um, became so popular that uh, as a performance show called Tom Shows um, that were also often done in blackface that uh, there most people actually knew the, um, the performances better than the novel itself. Uh, next slide. So um, 
when I initially was looking into um, my micro exhibit, uh, Nancy brought to my attention the um, Fisk Jubilee Singers who, um, who entered, sorry, um, the Jubilees, um, the Jubilee as a, um, as a performance style entered into the repertoire in 1870s, marking the first undeniably black music style in, um, in minstrel performance. And the Fisk uh, University Jubilee Singers uh, were part of Fisk University, an institution dedicated to the education of African-Americans that was founded in Nashville, Tennessee in 1866, shortly after the Civil War. Nearly 1,000 students um, were uh, a part of the university. A small endowment from the abolitionist Clinton B. Fitz and the backing of the American Missionary Association um, allowed the school, uh, was initially given um, to help the school, um, but the school still struggled financially. And in the early 1970s, uh, early fundraising campaigns by, student, uh, by a student chorus many of whom were formerly, formerly enslaved, um, created an ensemble to perform. Um, and because they had the shared history of emancipation, they called themselves the Jubilee Singers, um, performing songs uh, referred to as spirituals. The Jubilee Singers introduced this uh, African-American performance style uh, to audiences across the Northeast, England, and Europe, which is particularly notable because blackface minstrelsy as well as Tom shows were, um, were uh, American performance styles that would have traveled overseas into Europe. So for a lot of people, both in America and in Europe, uh, the first association that many people would have with African-American performance would be through the appropriation of black bodies in these um, performance styles. Next slide. Um, so I have here two, um, two documents, two performance documents from uh, the Jubilee Singers, one of which is a um, kind of a set list um, that features uh, the very popular song um, Swing Low Sweet Chariot, um, which they popularized in the 1870s. Next slide. Um, so next document on the side is a um, document that has reactions from uh, English uh, audiences who witnessed the fixed it's Jubilee singers as they performed in Europe, um, many of which uh, commented on their angelic voices, and um, it, it really gave a different uh, association, um, very different to that of the menstrual performances that they were used to. Um, on the other side, the kind of red image is um, a partisan and pool um, marquee um and it is from their famous ideal uncle tom's cabin uh performance in 1890 um in spencer massachusetts featuring the fitz jubilee singers um and quote um quote the jubilee singers were performing all the popular negro melodies besides their college fleas uh their stage presence was considered um was considered cool a cool high style of self-preservation and were perceived at the antithesis of traditional blackface minstrelsy. Um, and in the next example I give, there is kind of a tension between um, what side of the um, Uncle Tom's Cabin versus traditional minstrelsy people uh, lean into. Um, and, uh, and because these were such popular forms, it makes sense that, um, that they would appeal to audiences in this way. Um, but also it's, it's very notable that the Fisk Jubilee singers were um, often actually um, received very awkwardly by audiences at first because they were so different from the minstrel performances that they were used to. Uh, next slide. So, 
sorry. Um, so I, um, through doing this research, I wanted to, I started with the Jubilee Singers, but I wanted to find connections between uh, the Jubilee Singers and other Black performers who were um, performing at the same time. And I came across Matilda Sister Joy Jones, um, born 1868, and she was called Black Patty in reference to the Italian opera singer Adeline Patty Jones. And her repertoire included grand operas, light operas, and popular music. She was trained at the Providence Academy of Music and the New England Conservatory of Music. She performed at the White House for President Benjamin Franklin and sang for four consecutive presidents and the royal family. The Fitz Jubilee Singers also performed for the royal family when they were in England. And she met international success in the US, the West Indies, South America, Australia, India, South Africa, and Europe. And she was the highest African American, uh, the highest paid African American performer of her time. Um, she founded the Black Patty Troubadours, a musical and acrobatic act made up of 40 jugglers, comedians, dancers, and a chorus of 40 trained singers. Uh, she remained the star of the Troubadours for two decades, establishing their popularity in the principal cities of Canada and the US. Uh, she retired from performing in 1915. Um, and she is a tie in between the Fitz Jubilee Singers and the next performer that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, she traveled with the Fitz Jubilee Singers in her early career. Um, And uh, the final, uh, next slide. And the fi final performer that I am going to be talking about is um, Bob Cole, um, who was born in Athens, Georgia. Um, and in collaboration with Billy Johnson, who is also pictured on the picture to your left, um, produced a musical, A Trip to Coontown, in 1898, which was the first musical entirely created and owned by Black showmen. Um, Cole later partnered with J. Roseman Johnson, pianist and singer, and James Weldon Johnson, pianist and guitarist, on over 200 songs. Their vaudeville act featured classic piano pieces with sophisticated lyrics lacking in stereotypes. Uh, Sam T. Cook, while um, Sam T. Cook was a white entrepreneur for the Creole show, and he hired Bob Cole, um, who developed an act as a non-stereotypical minstrel performer called Willie Wayside, um, and he became a writer and manager for the show, um, performing in New England and New York, and became an important player in uh, Black Patty's Troubadours, um, as mentioned um, in my previous slides. Um, although he left when his success in songwriting did not result in better pay, and when he left the company, um, he was taken on suspicion. Uh, when he took his scripts with him, uh, he was accused of theft by the show's white managers, and he was uh, forced to publish his songs under a pseudonym from then on. Um, oh, next slide. Cole found success by 1902, um, both financially and creatively, and wrote um, an article in the Negro, uh, oh, sorry, in a Colored American magazine called The Negro and the, and the Stage, uh, where he revealed his concern for the stereotyping being placed on Black performers, especially the use of Black men as villains for fueled racist stereotypes. He also denounced um, adaptations of Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, that was that used African American stereotypes, um, and which kind of creates an ironic contrast because he uh, really leaned into traditional minstrel forms, um, but rejected the Uncle Tom uh, structure, whereas the Fist Jubilee singers um, did the opposite. They performed in Uncle Tom's Cabin but they um, really rejected the traditional, um, the traditional tropes of uh, minstrelsy. Um, but all of these performers uh, found ways to dissociate or obscure 
um, previous depictions of African American performance pre Civil War and created their own agency moving forward. Um, and I think specifically, this is a really rich and interesting time in Black performance because uh, both uh, spirituals and um, the, the shifts in Black-based minstrelsy became the basis for a lot of what we consider contemporary American pop culture. Um, and yes, that's my final slide. Thank you for having me and um, to our next and final presenter. Good afternoon. I am Jathan Martin, a third year Master of Divinity student from Apalachicola, Florida, and I am the curator of the Binding Keys Roadshow micro exhibit titled The Trouble I've Seen, Negotiating the Risk of Travel in African America. History is not everything, but it is a starting point. History is a clock that people use to tell their time of day. It is a compass they use to find themselves on the map of human geography. It tells them where they are, but more importantly, what they must be. John Henrik Clark. In African America, travel is risky. The sea, the underground, the sundown. To minimize the risk of white terror, Black people have choreographed maps towards safety. This micro exhibit maps the methodology of travel safety utilized within African American communities. The exhibit features African American spirituals from the John R. Johnson papers, concert advertisements for the Fish Jubilee singers from the Orpheus and McAdoo and Maddie Allen McAdoo papers, and published travel guides specifically for African Americans. Next slide, please. During the institution of chattel slavery in the United States, enslaved Africans used spiritual songs with coded meanings to guide those who sought to escape the plantation traveling on foot. These subversive songs like Wade in the Water and Steal Away to Jesus allowed the enslaved community to communicate paths towards freedom without their true meanings being legible. The Old Testament passages of the Israelites in exile resonated with the enslaved experience, which explains the extensive use of Hebrew Bible, historical figures, and landmarks. These songs were a navigational system that made clear when to be still, to walk north, to follow the streams, and to run. The document pictured is sheet music from the spiritual Steal Away to Jesus, arranged by John Rosen Johnson brother of James Weldon Johnson in 1942. Being published well after the era of enslavement, the sheet music pictured is more than likely not a mirror of the sound on the plantation, but its message still holds true. This song is often believed to gesture to those attempting to escape the plantation that the coast was clear or it was time to run. At the time of enslavement, these songs were not printed nor arranged. The enslaved people simply sang as the spirit led them. The freedom found in these songs did not disappear with the emancipation of enslaved people in 1865, but morphed into a new refined sound of protest against the physical, spiritual, and mental treatments of African-American people. Next slide, please. The fifth school, what would become a historically Black university, as Rebecca has mentioned, opposed lynching and the denigrating images of Black people through an ensemble known as the Fish Jubilee Singers. Founded in 1871, the Jubilee Singers introduced the spiritual as a study genre and art form. This uniquely African-American song form allowed them to travel and perform, but especially for the Jubilee Singers, travel was a risk. The document's picture highlight the extensive travel of the ensemble. The large concert poster offers reviews of the group from Queen Victoria, and the photo on the right, photograph on the right, is namely important because it shows the ways in which African American communities were attempting to rebrand their image as a mechanism of safety through a politic of respectability. Between 1877 and 1950, over 4,000 racial terror lynchings have been documented. While there was no escape for being African American, next slide, A.B. Stewart and the Bronze American was among those who created travel guides to minimize the risk of violence, embarrassment, and humiliation. 
African-American travelers relied on such guides to identify safe and friendly rest areas, attractions and accommodations. Stewart and the Bronze American, like the spirituals for the enslaved, were systematized through trial and error with the hopes that African-American families could find glimmers of peace and freedom as they traveled. As these documents are housed in the Beinecke Library, signifying their pastness, the document's ethos is present and futuristic. The document's pastness prompts us to question what stops what make the travel list today? And a bit more sinister question, what stops what not? As I attempt to explore this answer with you, I, I will read a lament of African-American travel by David Gray entitled Preparing for Daycare. Next slide, please. I need to drive my two-year-old to daycare tomorrow morning. To ensure we arrive alive, we won't take public transit, Oscar Grant. I removed all air fresheners from the vehicle and double-checked my registration status, Deontay Wright, and ensured my license plates were visible, Lieutenant Karen Nazaro. I'll be careful to follow all traffic rules, Philando Castile. Signal every turn, Sandra Bland. Keep the radio volume low, Jordan Davis. And won't stop at a fast food change for a meal, Richard Brooks. I'm too afraid to pray, Emmanuel Nine. So I just hope the car won't break down, Corey Jones. When my wife picks him up at the end of the day, I will remind her not to dance, Elijah McLean. Next slide. Stop to pay, play in the park to mere rice. Patronize the local convenience store for snacks, Trayvon Martin. After my wife and I tuck him into bed around 7.30, neither of us will go to the Walmart, John Crawford, or to the gym, or on a jog, Ahmaud Arbery. We won't even walk to see the birds, Christian Cooper. We'll just sit and try not to breathe, George Floyd, and try not to sleep, Breonna Taylor. In African America, travel is risky. Often, there is no right place or right time. Thank you. <laughs>